Thank you. All right. So, um, yeah, my name is Hannah Pinkos. I'm a developer here at Chariot Solutions. Okay. So, web development. Um, as web developers, we have to wear many hats where I can just dive in, do my code, submit it, and I'm done. So you might also have tasks like being a UI designer, figuring out um, how the, your, your requirements and turning them into something you can see on the screen. A UX engineer, um, you have an idea for a component, but you have to figure out how the functionality is gonna work so your users can um, you know, intuitively figure out how to click the buttons and figure out how to use it and where they're gonna go. Video expert. Uh, if you're building a website, it's going to be online and search engines and their ability for users to find it is really important. Um, also including things uh, more on the back end, like designing an API that your, your the website you're building might have to talk to another system. Uh, the system might be pulling things from a database that you have to manage. Uh, and this whole thing has to be put on the internet somehow. So you might also not be responsible for coordinating DevOps and getting it in the cloud and, and such. But today we're gonna to focus mostly on the front end side of things, um, like Rebecca said. Into some of the things that are important to consider before you even start your code. Um, before you start getting into building the code, you need to have a plan so that you're building the right thing and you're building the thing right. Uh, both of those super important. So usually where I start is a very top level, uh, have a site map. Um, this will answer questions like, how many pages are in your site? How are these pages related? And how does the user get to these pages? I've definitely been on projects where I thought I knew how things were going, but when I put it out in front of me in the site map, you might discover things like, um, this page doesn't seem to fit anywhere. Maybe we need to move our content and combine things or move things around so that this hierarchy makes more sense. Or it really seems like we're missing part of the story here. Maybe we need another page or so. Um, this, all, this is an example of a sitemap I created for, um, we redid our website for a nonprofit I work for. Um, and you can see here, having the sitemap also gave us cues for um, what should go in our primary navigation. So that was really easy to find. And then also what goes in our footer and, and other things for how users navigate around the site. Um, what's nice is having a style guide. Um, I'm sure these are some things that uh, were covered in the UI talk earlier today, but just real quick, at a minimum, it's helpful to have your color palette and your fonts. These are things that tend to influence your components as you're building them. So having an idea of what like the overall feel is gonna be upfront is super helpful. Um, extra time or wiggle room, it's helpful to have a plan for how and when are these colors going to be used. For example, you might have an accent color that you specifically want to use to signify when something is selected. Um, you might want to design some basic components like what your buttons, links, and form fields are going to look like. These are some of the most fundamental elements for how a user is going to be interacting with your site. Uh, every website is going to have a button somewhere. So having an idea of what that's going to look like ahead of time and maybe some behaviors for what it'll look like when the user hovers over it or when it's active or when it's in focus. Um, nice to have an idea ahead of time, as is with having a plan for your spacing. Um, so this would include page margins might be, how much space there's going to be between elements or between blocks of text, um, and for iconography. If you're working in a really specific industry, you might have a need for icons that, excuse me, that are uh, really specific for your industry that might not be in like the regular icon library. Um, so just having an idea um, is good if you need something non-standard. Spooky season, I made a prototype candy corn. Um, so before you dig into your code, uh, you want to have an idea of what your building is going to look like. I, like I've been in a uh, situation so many times where when I was building a prototype, I discovered like, hey, I completely overlooked this really important functionality in this requirement. I need to go back to the drawing board. And it's so much easier to do that when you're clicking and dragging things around in a prototype than when you're writing code to build it. Um, so at the bottom of this, we have wireframes. Wireframes are like your really basic layout. You don't need to worry about pictures. You don't even need to worry about text, but this will give you an idea of um, just to make sure that it has it, like every piece of the puzzle has a home on the page. 
Um, I like to, like, I, I put wireframes here on the bottom of our little candy corn pyramid because I think they're the most important part of the plan. I like to have a wireframe for every page that I'm going to be building, um, in, including both having a desktop format and the mobile format because we're probably going to need to support both. Um, up next, we have interactive prototypes. So from our wireframes, we can use some tools like uh, Figma and Sketch have great ways to kind of piece your wireframes together. So you click on one and it brings up the next page to give like an interactive demonstration of how these things might work once you code them. Um, this is a really good way of testing out functionality and also sharing it with other people on your team to make sure that um, the way that you thought something was intuitive, like they can figure it out too without having any instruction. And then at the top, we have our pixel perfect prototypes. So if you're fortunate enough to have a designer on your team, like this is something that your, your UI designer might give you a pixel perfect prototype for every screen you have, which is amazing. But unfortunately, you don't always have resources for design. So you might have to make a couple of pixel perfect prototypes, uh, mockups for yourself. Um, it, it's helpful to like combine what the colors from your style guide with the layouts you have from your mockups and just see like what, what this all overall look was gonna look like. So you don't have to have one of these for every screen, um, just to like uh, be able to have visual representation. Or once you go to implement it, you can kind of refer to some of these that you've created to influence like as you're building other pages. Um, so yeah, because unfortunately, we, we had to pick and choose how we allocate our time and having time to build out uh, pixel perfect mockups where every page is probably not realistic. Tip I refer to as you're designing, if you have to design as a developer, is this quote that's probably attributed to Pablo Compasso. Uh, as far as any quote from the internet goes, it's hard to say if he actually said this, but good designers copy and great designers steal. Um, we're lucky that there's been a lot of people who have built great apps before us. So we don't have to um, figure out how to do everything from scratch. Like in the early days of building software, uh, the developers had to figure out a way to translate things you would do in the physical world to make it intuitive for a web, like a, a desktop so many great sites that have made so many great decisions along the way. And the best thing to do is be consistent and don't surprise your users and um, use consistent standards from what uh, already exists. So for example, um, things that are kind of established, like your primary navigation should be on the top of the page. Um, if you have a sidebar, it should come out of the left. I actually had a project where I thought it made more sense for the, the design for the sidebar to be on the right. But when I went into usability testing, it might as well have not existed. None of the users saw it. Like it, they, they were looking around like the whole page trying to find out where they're going to go. So that's a great example of why it's important to use established standards because they would have expected it to pop out on the left. Um, and then things like uh, we are stuck with the floppy disk being the save icon <laughs> because Microsoft Office picked a while ago. And even though a lot of people have probably never seen a floppy disk now. Um, that's what they expect the save icon to look like. Um, but I guess luckily with autosave, we're kind of chasing out the need for, for a save button anyway. So we'll get away from that eventually. Um, so yeah, my tips there, look for what your competitors do. Um, bookmark sites you think work well. I have like a, a folder that's saved that is just all of the that I look at if I'm like building a new component on something, I'm not quite sure how to do it. Just looking around and, and seeing what other people do is super helpful to like give you that spark of an idea uh, of where to go. Um, and then uh, I really recommend this book, Don't Make Me Think. Um, it was written, a recent version came out in 2014, but the, the principles there are absolutely hold up for how to build a website that is usable, common sense, easy for people to understand. So. Um, if you're a developer and just start like have some needs to design and uh, implement things, I would definitely re recommend reading that book. Um, next thing you need to do is know your users. Um, so these are some general statistics uh, from, from this year in North America. 
um, your users probably look very different than you. Um, they are probably using a different operating system. They're maybe using a different browser. They probably don't have like a giant 4K monitor. In fact, they might not even have an HD monitor. So it's important when you're building your site, you're keeping these things in mind and it's gonna work well for the majority of your users. Um, so just overall stats, we have like about 50-50 between mobile and desktop usage for the web. There's this 1%, which is other, which I think is things like people who use the browser on their PlayStation or their smart fridge or their Tesla. Things like that always fascinated me seeing, seeing those statistics. Um, it's also pretty split between Windows and iOS and for all the browsers. So, um, and also a pretty even split between iPhone and Android, which I was surprised because I'm an Android user and I feel like everybody I know has an iPhone. <laughs> um, so I'm glad that I'm not alone. Yeah, let's go back. So uh, these are like general statistics, but depending on your use case, your users might be a little different. Like on the construction project I worked on, we were building an app that was mostly gonna be used on iPads on the job site. So we didn't have to worry about mobile there. Um, or if you're developing an app that's more for like social media, the majority of your users might be mobile. Like for the NORAD Track Santa project I worked on, uh, especially when we got like to more recent years, we were like seeing something like 80, 85% of the users were on their smartphones because it was Christmas Eve, they're probably in front of their Christmas tree in their living room checking in on Santa then. Um, so knowing your users is important to know if you need to optimize for mobile or, or for desktop or another format. So based on these, there are some general safe assumptions we can make. Your site probably needs to work on both mobile and desktop and mobile first design is a great way to go about supporting both. Um, so the general idea is that you'll want to First, create a design that works really great on mobile because that's the harder format to plan for. Um, so once you have your design that works well on mobile, uh, you can use progressive enhancement to add more features and more complexity for bigger screens. Um, so this is just general to make sure that your site works great on both formats. Going from a large design and trying to make it smaller can be a lot more difficult. Um, all operating systems, seem to be about equally important. So you should have a plan to test for these and uh, test for different browsers and different configurations to make sure that all your users are getting generally the same experience. Um, and Internet Explorer. Microsoft, uh, with, they finally officially ended support in June, which is great because it's been the bane of existence for web developers for so many years because it lacked so many really useful features and having to do compatibility was a problem. Um, Edge has this weird legacy mode where you can like turn Edge into IE, but it's hidden like way deep in a menu. It seems to mostly be for um, like people in business situations might have like an MP API or Flash app or something that is needed for their business use case that is outdated and hasn't been replaced, but they need it to work. Um, so Microsoft has decided to be nice to those people and help them out. Um, is that Safari seems to be the new Internet Explorer. Uh, while it has uh, for most of the modern features in your, your HTML, CSS, JavaScript, it seems to implement things just a little bit differently. So like um, if, if you've been coding and developing your website in Chrome the whole time, and then you're done, and then you go and you go to test it in Safari, you might be surprised by how different things look. So it's a good idea to look between all these as you're kind of developing. To, to make sure things are consistent. Um, quick note about, uh, you, you wanna make sure you have the right text back before you get started. Um, there, I think we just had a great talk about picking a framework, but before we think about a framework, uh, there are bigger questions to answer. Like, are we having a single page application or multi-page app, uh, server-side rendering or static site generation? So typically my method for going around choosing these things is I'll answer these big questions to narrow down to a set of frameworks that I think will be helpful. And then I draft up a document listing out like benefits and cons of each of them so that once I make a decision, I can like re read through my reasoning and have like really solid reasons to, to, to back up my choices. And things that affect your decisions for tech stack are things like scalability, build time, um, 
the frequency that your content is going to be changing. For example, know that your content is going to be changing constantly. You might not want to pick a static site generator with a long build time because by the time that one thing finishes, like one build finishes, gets deployed, gets out there, your, your content might have changed three or four times and then you're kicking off all these subsequent builds. So server side rendering might be the better choice for, um, for an application like that. So just some things to keep in mind. And with that, we can get into our implementation. So this is the exciting part. This is what we live for for developers. Hopefully we have the plan in place. We, we, we've talked to the client, we've talked to our team and we are ready to go, almost. <laughs> Uh, we need to set up our project. And my advice here is to set up your environment and your tooling end to end as early as possible. This includes things like having a system for your documentation, um, having your IDE configured to help you find errors along the way, um, linting. I love using a code formatter so I don't have to worry about where my white space is. Um, have your testing framework in place, uh, get your build scripts and um, have your environment configured both so you can run locally and you can run it in like a sandbox that mimics your um, final deploy environment. I've definitely been in situations where I've been working on a site mostly locally and then I went to deploy it to the cloud and I had to reconfigure a bunch of things because I made some assumptions that, that weren't necessarily compatible. So having your tooling and your um, end to end configuration in place as early as possible. Um, is definitely going to help you in the long run. It'll save you um, from having big mistakes that have like really uh, and fix them early on instead of letting them, uh, you know, kind of get out of hand. And then also, hopefully, I, I don't need to say this to most of you, but get familiar with your developer tools. The the the, the Chrome Developer Console is so helpful for helping you to figure out if your app is working, if uh, there's Maybe problems that you didn't anticipate. Um, there was a page that I was building recently that without the console open, it looked like it was working great. But when I opened the console, because I made an error somewhere. So you should have your site is working, set up breakpoints, and make sure your code is executing as you expect. Um, Use the configuration to like make styling tweaks in browser so you don't have to like keep going back to your editor and saving and reloading. Um, leverage responsive like the, the mobile preview so you can test the mobile view on your site as you're building it. Yeah, I just I'm always surprised by how many people don't look at their console as a developer. So this is this is the hill I will die on. <laughs> building out your site. Like I mentioned earlier, we need to support both mobile and desktop. And the most popular way to do this is to have responsive pages. So um, the basic idea is that when your site is on like the desktop layout, it has one structure. And then based on the screen size, things will reformat and resize and rescale um, based on the screen size. So um, we'll just do a quick overview of this. I'm sure this is something a lot of you have heard of before. Um, so the Excuse me. For building a responsive site, the grid seems to be one of the most popular ways to achieve this. So this is something that was revolutionized by Bootstrap. Um, they uh, adopted the 12 column grid, which is a, a really nice way to let you break up your components. So the basic idea is you have like every, every page has 12 columns and you tell your components inside the page in the row how many columns they should span based on the screen size. So on these two um, example pictures I put uh, in, in the first row, we have our components spanning four columns at like a desktop format. And then when it squeezes down to a mobile format, they, re they take out 12 columns and then kind of reposition to be stacked on top of each other. Um, yeah, so like I said, Bootstrap was really instrumental in establishing this, and they were a super useful tool, but they were also why every website between 2012 and 2018 kind of looked the same. <laughs> My recommendation would be to skip Bootstrap and um, maybe consider using a different UI kit like Tailwind that's a little lighter weight. Um, Bootstrap comes with a lot of components, which is helpful. But it's also, again, like I said, every site you look the same because they were all using the bootstrap components. 
Um, using a UI kit is really helpful if you're just starting out with CSS and learning styling because they have a lot of good practices built in, a lot of really helpful utilities. Um, but I personally have kind of gotten away from using a uh, UI kit in favor of building my own utilities and my own styles. Um, because anytime you're using a third party library, there's probably a lot of stuff in there that you might not end up needing in the long run. Um, and especially if you're developing a really particular style, you'll probably have to do a lot of customization anyway. So maybe consider skipping the UI kit. Um, some other tips for to consider when building a responsive site. Um, use the pointer events API instead of uh, like click or mouse down or mouse up to make sure that your interaction uh, user events are compatible both for pointer devices like your mouse and your, your, your touch devices on your um, screens. Rely on hover for displaying or changing information. Again, because on the desktop we have a mouse, we can hover. There really isn't a concept of hover on mobile. Make sure your buttons and links are tappable so there's a large enough target for someone to touch them. Um, don't have any fix with elements because when you just, like screen uh, shrink down the screen size, they might overflow off the end of the page. Don't forget about mobile landscape orientation. Um, most of the time people are using their, their phone in a portrait, but maybe for like a tablet device or, or like if people have a really large phone, they might switch it to landscape mode to read something. So just don't forget about that. Um, all right. So for building your layout, there are two pretty much main ways to display that you would be using. Since we don't have to worry about IE anymore, layouts have gotten so much easier because I, I feel like it used to be a guessing game of like nested containers and floats and absolute positioning. But now we can pretty much reliably rely on grid and flex. So grid is what it sounds like. It lets you define a layout based on rows and columns. So it's, um, think of it as like two dimensional. So you can define your rows, your columns, you can tell the content within it, which of these rows and columns to occupy. It's really great for content that has more of a known width. So maybe you'll know that you have three elements in a row and you want them all to be equally spaced. So you can have them all be like one, one third width. Your other option is for flex. So it's better for things where you might not know the number of elements inside a container, or maybe you have different pictures that might have different widths in a container. So um, flex is considered more one dimensional because you don't have rows and columns. You have just kind of a container with stuff in it. And there are options for having it overflow or wrap or kind of scale or stretch or shrink depending on how many things wind up in there. Um, so me. Um, there are a lot of different options for both grid and flex. I recommend checking out the blog posts on CSSTricks.com, which is where I borrowed these graphics from because they do a really good job explaining the different styling options you can set on both the parents and the children. Um, super helpful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so there are a lot of use cases where you could probably get away with using either grid or flex. Um, because they're, they're, like I said, they're both flexible. They have a lot of different options they support. So my advice would be to always prefer using grid if you can. Um, it's a lot more uh, predictable because flex supports kind of like auto spacing and auto scaling and drinking. It might have some unexpected side effects. Um, it's in a component or the size of the picture could, um, that could pop unless you have a specific use case uh, where flex is a better decision. We want to use semantic HTML. So we used to build sites pretty much using only two tags. We had our divs, which were the, the, the block elements that take up the, the full width of the parent container. Or we have spans, which are our inline elements when we needed to line things up. Um, now we have so many more options for tags that we should be using to add meaning to the code that we're writing. So the header of your page should be in a header tag, the footer in a footer tag, so on and so forth. Um, this is helpful for both web crawlers for search engine optimization and for people using adaptive technologies like a screen reader. Um, some rules for to give your page a hierarchy kind of structure. 
So every page should have like one H1 for your page title. And then under your, your, your heading page title, you might have H2 for sections, H3 for subsections. Um, it's not a good idea to use different headings just to change the font size. This is something you would maybe want to control in your CSS rather than like picking a H2 just because you want your font to be bigger since they have meaning attached to it. Your code, uh, prefer browner native functionality as much as possible. Browsers have feature parity now, so we don't have to worry as much about creating custom components so things work the same across different browsers. So for some examples, we should use a select, a select component instead of writing a custom combo box or list box. Um, brand new, we should use the log component instead of writing a custom modal. Um, just very recently, Safari uh, added official support for dialogue. So this will cut down on the amount of code on so many websites that have custom like modals for pop-ups. And then a personal pet peeve of mine, um, don't change or hide your scroll bars. Uh, this is like the, the, the people are used to the behavior that on the device and the operating system in the browser that they're familiar with. So if you go on and, and change it, it might confuse them a little bit. Um, for, for my case, I'm primarily a Windows user, but I guess Macs kind of auto hide their scroll bars. As a window user, I rely on the scroll bar being there to signify to me that a page is scrollable. So it's confusing if someone has kind of custom or, or hit it. And if you're primarily a Mac user, you might not even be aware that this is the, the, the case or the problem. The JavaScript side of things, we also want to uh, prefer using the native browser API as much as possible. So for example, we want to use the native promises instead of the promise, promise library. Um, we can use the fetch API instead of adding a custom Ajax library. Um, and we don't need jQuery. <laughs> jQuery was great for so many years for adding that or for adding that additional layer to have compatibility between browsers. But because most modern browsers support most features now, we really don't need it and we shouldn't keep adding it. Uh, it's, it's a lot easier to maintain code that is written using the native browser. Um, and can I use.com is always a great resource if you need to look up if something is supported uh, across all the main browsers. Um, as you're building the site, you should keep accessibility in mind so that your app is easy to use by the widest possible audience, including those with visual disabilities, mobility disabilities, um, hearing differences, and cognitive differences like dyslexia or, or, or things like that. Um, so supporting different ways to allow users to navigate your site is a big one. So this might be keyboard navigation or screen reader compatibility. Um, so if you're navigating a site with the keyboard or using the keyboard interface, um, as you kind of tab around, you should have a visual focus around the elements so the user knows what they're selecting. And then if, uh, if you haven't used a screen reader, I would highly recommend it to anybody to kind of see or um, ex experience how people that use screen readers experience the internet. Um, to make your site most uh, screen reader compatible, you should have things like descriptive alt text on your images. Um, the keyword here being descriptive, if your alt text is just like photo of John, that's not really giving the person using a screen reader any information if they have visual differences and aren't able to see that picture. So something like John wears a white shirt and a red tie would be a little more helpful for giving them a closer experience to someone who can see that picture. Um, we can also add ARIA roles to signify um, what role an element might have if it's like a, a list or a select or some sort of navigation. Um, but again, we want to use these sparingly because we should use the built-in browser functionality as much as we can. So instead of having like a div that has role equals button, we should just use the button. Um, so there's a lot of other things to keep in mind for making your site accessible, um, making sure that the contrast of your text is, is readable, not relying solely on colors to signify meaning, um, having captions for your audio and video and supporting text scaling. So um, for sizing your text, uh, you, you can have like a base size and then we recommend using either percentages 
or REM units uh, to define all the sizes for things on your website. So if you go into your browser settings and um, there's like a an, an way to set your font size in your browser without like doing like zoom in and zoom out. So if you go and set the font size in your browser, the, page, the, the font on the page is bigger and all, everything that you're seeing on the page, you wanna make sure scales appropriately. All right, um, two more quick things to consider as you're building out your app. One would be dark mode. It seems to be very uh, popular nowadays to have different themes for your site for the user to pick from. Um, I, I, I've read a lot of things about like why you should choose dark mode, including things like maybe it reduces eye strain, it lowers the energy usage for people using mobile devices, you don't want to like, drain their battery. Um, some people think it's easier to read on a dark mode. Uh, some people think there's less blue light, so blue light, I guess, maybe disrupts your sleep. But as far as I have found, there isn't really any comprehensive study that has backed up any of these claims. Um, but it seems to be a personal preference, which I think is a really great reason to support having a dark or light mode. Um, a lot of people use dark mode, and having that option for them uh, makes your site more usable for them, more, more friendly, and I think is a good enough reason to uh, consider adding support for that. And then the other one we're going to talk about is progressive web apps. So a progressive web app helps your site work more like a mobile app on your smartphone. So the user can install it to their home screen. Um, it can support things like offline, offline usage or push notifications. And especially since the trend has gone towards more people using their phones to navigate the internet, um, considering adding a progressive web app uh, implementation to your site is a pretty good idea. And it's actually not that hard to add. There's just two main pieces that you need to add. So, to find some metadata related to your site, including things like properties to put on the home screen, um, what your icon should look like. Uh, I think you can set a background color. And then the big piece of the implementation is your service workers. Service or workers are scripts that run in the background as people are on your site, and they might do things like um, save some resources to cache, or they might be responsible for um, sending up the, the, the push notifications to the device. So um, because mobile phone connectivity is maybe a little less reliable, um, adding a service worker to support um, like, like an offline mode is super handy. So um, in order to do this, you would have your service worker download or cache different resources to save on the user's device. And then the next time they open the progressive web app, if they're offline, your service worker might like try to make a network request to load some resources. Um, but in the meantime, they can pull some resources from the cache instead so that the user has something displayed on screen. The site is still usable, even like maybe in a more limited fashion. Um, but it's still usable even though they're offline. The main thing we're going to talk about for implementation is search engine optimization. As you're writing your code, it's important as a developer to make sure you're following best practices um, in your code to make sure your site is discoverable through search engines because most people want people to find their site and that's like the main way that people find your site. So luckily, if we followed a lot of the uh, suggestions and best practices that I've kind of covered up to now, you've already done a lot of this. <laughs> so it, it, it's not that hard to, to, to add. So the first would be to define your, your sitemap XML file, um, which should look like the sitemap that you laid out before you started your site. Um, we also add a, a robots text file, which just kind of gives the um, web crawler some information about how to navigate your site. Um, we have our alt text for images. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that this alt text is for accessibility. You shouldn't pack your alt text for with keywords just for the um, search engines because you're not your like primary target for that. Um, and then making sure that you have semantic HTML, which we already talked about, and your meta tags at the top of the page. So defining your title. Um, having good descriptions, um, having uh, tags for your social media cards. So if someone shares a link to your site, 
it, on, on Twitter or something, it pulls up like a nice picture that, that goes with that page. Um, and then the last thing that seems to be um, more and more important for search engines is a fast page loading speed, which is why we're gonna take a little bit of time to talk about performance. Um, so it's important for sites to be fast. Users do not wait for slow sites. Um, it's shown that people will maybe wait three-ish seconds for a page to load. And if it doesn't, they're going back to find something else. So um, there's a couple things we wanna think about when like determining, is my page fast? So the one thing that we start with is first contentful paint. So this is the first thing that your page renders that lets the user know like, okay, I've landed on the site, <laughs> this, this page isn't broken. Um, we want this to come up almost instantaneously. So we don't wanna wait for a bunch of things to load and have like a white screen and then everything pop in once it's finished loading. So one strategy for this might be just like display some sort of graphic and display a spinner just to signify to the user that your site is working. <laughs> And then um, we have our largest contentful paint, which is also known as maybe the first meaningful paint, uh, depending on who you talk to. So this is the stage of your page loading where most of the important text and maybe some images are loaded. So the like first viewport, like the first thing that the user sees is mostly filled in. Um, so our goal for this is to be less than two and a half seconds for this to load in. So in this, these example images that I pulled from, um, from the web.dev, which is Google's resource, um, we have at the top, we have our first contentful paint, which just shows the nav. And then the next thing, our large contentful paint, now we have maybe placeholders for some of the, these images, but we have most of the important text loaded so that the user understands what they're looking at. And then we have, finally, we have time to interactive. So this is the time between when the user loads the page and when they can start navigating and clicking buttons and kind of using the app. So in order to avoid frustrating the user by have, like having them sit on a page where, okay, I see what I want to do, but I'm clicking this button and nothing's happening. Um, that also might be a reason that they bounce back and look for something else. So our goal is to have this, like your whole page loaded working in three and a half seconds do like low hanging fruit to have great performance on your website, um, remove unused JavaScript. So this might be either functions you wrote that you didn't end up needing, or like if, especially if there's a third party library that you're importing and then not really using, um, make, make sure that you do your cleanup and remove it. Um, same goes for unused CSS files. You'll want to combine and minify your JavaScript and CSS for hosting. So you can use tools like Webpack and Rollup. Um, so in order to reduce the, no you want to reduce the number of network requests that your app is making. So instead of loading in like 10 individual JavaScript files, which might take longer, if you combine them into one file, you can load it all in at once. Um, and then finally, if you have a, like a really large app, um, or maybe you're using a third party library, but you only need like a tiny piece of it, you can leverage tree shaking. So instead of requiring in the entire third party library, you can um, import just one module and then your build system like Rollup or Webpack has methods built in to only use the, the modules that you end up importing in instead of importing the entire library. Um, optimize your images. So images tend to be the largest part, like byte-wise, of any web page. Um, they, especially if you have like really nice, pretty backgrounds or high-resolution images, um, these are take a lot of space. So in order to optimize your images, um, you want to start by using SVGs where possible. So this would be for any vector graphics, like your logos, icons, um, and then we used to have the advice of use PNG for graphics and JPEG for photos. Um, I would no longer recommend this. I would say use WebP for all of your images. So WebP is a new-ish format. Um, it has great compression. It works for um, both graphics and photos and um, is a great, and it's also now supported by most modern browsers. 
So I would say prefer to use WebP um, if you can for all your images. Um, for a site that I made recently, like I, it, it was really photo based. So the, the photos I would get from the client were JPEG. And then as part of my build process, I, I have a step that takes all the JPEGs that are in this source directory, converts them to WebP, and then puts that in the build for the site. Um, make sure your images are compressed. This goes with, um, with, with, with all of your files when you're serving from the cloud. You want to make sure that they're gzipped. Um, and then lastly, consider using responsive images. So this is a, a fairly new method. It lets you, instead of having a single source image for, your, uh, for this picture on your site, you can create and define a set of images so that maybe you have a really low resolution version that would pop in on a, like a, a mobile device or a smaller screen. And then you have a really big high resolution version that would be loaded on a 4K monitor. It doesn't make sense to have that really high resolution version if you're seeing it on like a tiny phone screen, um, but it gives a great experience to someone who does have that 4K monitor if, um, the, um, if the resolution version is available. Um, so there are two ways to support this. You can use the, the image tag with the source set uh, property. This lets you put in like as, as many different image URLs as you want with different screen sizes that uh, to tell the browser which one it should pick based on your screen size or different properties. And then um, I would recommend using the picture tag because in your picture tag, you can have like one line for each of your images. I think the code is just a little nicer, um, but both are good ways to support this. Um, and the, the picture tag also, if for some reason someone is using a device that doesn't support WebP, it allows you to define a um, fallback image. So you can have like um, different tags, like sources for the WebP version. And then you might have like your fallback version, that's the JPEG, so that if the user's device doesn't support it, that, that image will still show up. And then we have a couple more performance optimizations we can quickly go over. Um, so um, make sure that you have decent caching. So like maybe you, if the, um, you don't want the name of your file to change all the time unless that file is changing so that it can be cached both at like the, the, the server level and on your browser. Um, we can reduce the number of HTTP requests. Um, that this is a reason that you might want to combine your JavaScript. Um, I guess the way for performance optimizations is only spend time optimiz optimizing if you're noticing that your site is slow. <laughs> um, there's really no sense going in and making a lot of these tweaks and trying to optimize and combine your images into one thing with like different um, um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's all I have to say about performance. And that's pretty much all I have to say about um, modern front end web development. So that's my brain dump of ideas. Hopefully you guys found this helpful um, and I can take the last couple of minutes to answer any questions.